to call this meeting of the Del Mar College Board of Regents to order at 1 p.m. on Tuesday, June 11th. Uh, we have a quorum and can conduct business. Would you please join me for a moment of silence? Thank you. Ms. Averitt, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And would you all please join the board in reciting the mission statement of Del Mar College? Del Mar College provides access to quality education, workforce preparation, and lifelong learning for student and community success. Del Mar College is streaming live audio and video from the official Board of Regents meetings on the college's website in real time, with the exception of portions of the meeting considered as closed session by statute. We will begin our meeting today with a very special faculty recognition. Uh, Ms. Lenora Keyes is going to introduce that for us. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to uh, recognize Mac Appersbach for his dedicated 38 years of teaching at Del Mar College. Mac, would you like to join me up here? I feel like we came at the same time. <laughs> That's right. Mac is a professor in our radio and television program in the Department of Communications, Languages, and Reading. Mac is here today to be recognized for receiving the distinguished honor of being named the Texas Association of Broadcasters Educator of the Year. Mac has worked in the broadcast industry in one form or another since 1972. He started on air at the campus radio station at John Brown University in Arkansas, eventually being promoted to station manager. Upon graduation, Mac joined at KAMO Rogers Bentonville, Arkansas, and then KBUD Athens and KPAN in Hereford. After completing his master's degree in radio, television, and film at the University of North Texas, he joined the faculty at Del Mar College in 1981. The Del Mar radio television program was only a year old when Mac joined us and when he was hired. And under his leadership, the program has gone from a converted classroom to a specially designed television studio and auxiliary rooms for audio and video editing, as well as a suite as specifically designed for radio. Throughout his career, Mac has always provided his students with the best training possible and made it comparable as possible to any TV station or radio station in the industry. Many of his former students have gone on to be successful careers in Texas stations, both to, within Texas and nationally. Mac has also been an active member of the Texas Association of Broadcast Educators and since the 1980s. He served in a couple of capacities as secretary treasurer for the past 25 or more years. He will be formally recognized as educator of the year at the Texas Association of Broadcasters convention this August in Austin. Please join me in congratulating Mac in this great honor. Mac, congratulations. <laughs> Say a few words. Like to say a few words. Please do a podcaster. <laughs> I guess the best thing to say is that um, I've always had my students at heart as to what I want the best for them. And uh, a lot of people are, you know, helping me along the way. It's not me only, but by no means. You know, I've had years of help from Channel 3, Channel 6, Channel 10, uh, Kyoto, all four. Many of those people are gone. Who knows where they've gone? But they've hired my students, and it's been a wonderful opportunity that way. 
And then some of the students have been exceptional, perhaps in the right place, right time, which in this business, that's the way it always is. And um, so as I was posting on Facebook last week, uh, I've always pointed out to my students that I've had successful students everywhere, and I always mention CNN, because I do have students at CNN, three students currently, at the fourth, but she uh, stepped back to go back to Austin. And so I always point out that you can <coughs> go many different directions, a lot of things that you can do. Educators here in town, Catherine Hewitt at King High School, uh, Javier Barrientes at Miller High, uh, those are former students who've gone into education. And that's the thing that I always push, I tell students, get your degree, get your associates, get your bachelors, and always have that to fall back on. Thank you. Thank you very much. And on behalf of the Board of Regents, we want to congratulate you for a lifetime of wonderful service. We, we, we know the faces of your students and the voices of your students locally, and, and congratulations. We, this is an honor for the institution, but we honor you. Thank you. We will now move into staff reports, and we will begin with uh, a summary of uh, some recent changes to the policy manual that the board approved. Uh, well, you'll go into that. We approved some months ago. <laughs> Ms. McDonald. Thank you. Yes, as, as you just, just spoke, in the September of 2018 board meeting, the Board of Regents approved the following action. to move forward with revisions to all B policies and the college's manual of policies and procedures with the appropriate personnel title and our designation. And in that same meeting, the board was also notified of the following, um, the following notification. Such revisions will also be made to all the effective administrative or A policies as deemed necessary. <coughs> to bring you this, the summary of that project. So if, if you look at the listing, um, any any reference that was made to president, we were going to revise or we revised to chief executive officer. Um, and, and moving along with these different designations and subtitles, because regardless of what anyone's underlying title is, there will always be a chief executive officer. There will always be a chief academic officer, regardless of if you're a vice president, executive vice provost, regardless, you're going to be, there's going to be a chief executive officer, chief academic officer, chief financial officer, regardless of those underlying maybe given title. So looking to the future also, um, so we don't have to come back possibly and, and make revisions later on, um, we decided to go with all the different de designations. So um, the Vice President of Instruction was revised to Chief Academic Officer. We had a Vice President of Instruction and Student Services, or there was a Provost and Vice President of Student Affairs. They were revised to one of the following, depending on the context of the policy. If it related to academics, it was chief academic officer. If it was related more to the student affairs area, the student services, um, that was changed to chief student affairs officer. Um, Vice president of student affairs or student services was revised to the chief student affairs officer. Um, Vice president of administration and finance was revised to one of the following, again, depending on the context of the policy. Um, if the policy related to financial, then it was chief financial officer, chief human resource officer, or chief risk management officer, or chief physical facilities officer. There was also a couple of references to um, election manager, which the board actually uh, appoints an election manager for, for, the, for the, excuse me, for the election cycle. Um, there are references to executive director of administration and human resources or executive director of human resources was revised to chief human resource officer. Um, assistant to the president or executive director of uh, area and college relations has been revised to chief public relations officer. Uh, chief information technology officer was revised to chief information officer. And then director of risk management has been revised to chief of security. So now all the, the proper designations relate to um, those areas appropriate for those functions. And uh, the policy work was done basically in a manual offline. So I wanted to make sure I gave you the report and the summary before I submit that into um, our, our representative with IT so they can upload the entire policy manual back into the live online manual. With so approximately how many revisions were made? 
No, I did not sit and count, but <laughs> I can tell you there's over, if you actually print the manual, there's over 400 pages, and there was at least 60% of the policy manual that was affected in some form or fashion okay. with some type of this designation change. Okay. Yes, and then when will it be uploaded, <laughs> approximately? Um, I'm going to, since I'm going to submit it, if not this evening, then in the morning to IT, and they're very good about getting things quickly uploaded depending on, on if they have a special project going on, but it, it should be it should be uploaded within the week, within about a week. Yes. Okay. Other questions? The election manager will that change at every election cycle, or will it continue to be Jessica? Well, the board designates that um, every election year. So, like we're in an off year, so next year we bring you um, orders and resolutions, and then the board has to name that person. So it's it's at the pleasure of the board who they actually designate as election manager. Right now, yes, it's Miss Elanis. You've designated but her. Usually, it's better to keep the same person for consistency, isn't it? Or somebody knowledgeable with the election laws. Well, there's a lot of experience that's there. At, again, that's at the that's at the pleasure of the board. But yes, I would. Yeah. Excuse me, sir. Yes. Okay. Thank you for Any that questions? report. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Ms. Villarreal will now give us a legislative update, I'm sure with some input from Dr. Escamilla. <laughs> Good afternoon, Regents. So I'm here to provide you the 86th legislature update as of today. Um, we still have until Sunday, June 16th, for the governor to officially sign or veto any bill that was signed, uh, passed during regular session. So I'd like to start off with um, our priorities when it comes to our community colleges and our students, which is our appropriations. Um, we've discussed House Bill 1, which was the state budget. Again, that's our core operation money, our success point, and contact hours. As Dr. Escamilla mentioned earlier, um, our legislators are really looking at success points and, uh, and putting a lot of emphasis on what we're doing to get our students through. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, this year there was an increase statewide of $48.3 million into the success point bucket. So um, I do believe they mean, they mean business with that. Um, we are currently at uh, $202.50 per student success point. That is significantly up from the last session, which I believe we were at 172. Okay, so that is significant. Um, our contact hours went up slightly. Cooperation stayed about the same, but again, success points is really where it was at in terms of our appropriations. Um, we had also discussed at the uh, last uh, board meeting um, the, uh, the uh, supplemental appropriations. If you remember, there was some money trying to be put aside uh, for the colleges that were affected by Hurricane Harvey. Um, unfortunately, uh, that line item was cut in the appropriations, so we are not going to be receiving that approximately uh, $97,000 that had been that had been set aside. The total appropriations increase for us for the biennium was $1.236 million, something. so it's about uh, 1.2 above last time, so total. We did miss out on that Hurricane Harvey money. I was much to my regret, but... Um, Please continue. And so uh, what we do know is as part of that uh, money from the rainy day fund, uh, 3.6 billion of that uh, went into uh, flood planning and management. So you can kind of gauge the priorities of the state right now in, it, in terms of disaster relief in certain areas <coughs> or in strategic planning instead of recovery. Um, and also um, Mr. Garcia is going to go into the specifics of the budget and our appropriations in his talk here in just a second. So. Um, continuing on with the general overview, uh, we've got SB2, which was the property tax. Um, and that um, has been sent over to the governor's office. Um, that was sent over on the 28th, so that has yet to be signed. Um, however, um, we're, you know, we're happy to say um, because of the strong collaboration that we had with TAC, um, with Senator Florence uh, Shapiro and her group, um, we were able to secure an exemption. Um, for our community colleges and the uh, uh, and lowering the rollback rate uh, provisions. So that has, to this point, been successful. So we'll see. Dr. Eskimi, anything you want to add on that? Okay. Yeah. Um, um, that was pretty much um, the general overview for appropriations. Um, what I'd like to do is then touch on some things that are happening academically. Um, as we talked about dual credit, 
um, didn't receive so much attention this session based um, on the issue before on the question of necessity or rigor. Um, however, what you're starting to see in Regent Rivas, you, you talked about it earlier, um, our K-12 population. Um, we're really looking at uh, bills that uh, help with the transition and to be more consistent streamlining between K-12 and higher ed. So there was SB 1276 and 1324 um, that really talked about, you know, establishing those common advising strategies, aligning endorsements. You're starting to hear that talk in the legislature. So you'll start to see those alignments start to happen and, and become a little bit more solid as we move forward. Specifically with transfer success, this last, uh, last a meeting we talked about SB 25 by Senator Royce West. That one was relating to measures to facilitate transfer academic progress and timely graduation of students in public higher education institutions. This is the bill that I talked about with you that we had a really strong collaboration between the four years and the community colleges. Uh, so what, um, what our legislature has told us is that um, they don't think this can be solved uh, in this legislative session. So what they have done in the bill is that they have created an advisory committee that's being headed up by the coordinating board. It's going to have equal representation of two years and four years, and they're really going to look at the core and the student challenges. Um, now, Dr. Escamilla mentioned earlier that um, we're in an age where the state is going to start coming in and mandating certain things like pathways. When you read SB 25, you're hearing terminology like meta majors, core, statewide transitioning. And so you're starting to hear the language that is really going in that direction. And uh, I do want to end on the free speech bill. It was SB 18. Um, and Augie and I have been talking about this one. This one's related to the protection of expressive activities at public institutions of higher ed. Um, as a board, you will uh, need to be filled in on that one. So as soon as that passes, uh, we will start going into the details of that and making sure that Del Mar is set up. Our policies are pretty strong already, but we want to make sure we have all the details with that one as well. Um, as of today, as of today, there's currently this minute no specific language about going into special session. <laughs> but uh, we'll see how that goes as well. Again, we have until Sunday, May 16th. Um, for the governor to veto or to sign. Um, and so that's kind of a general overview right now. Does anybody have any questions? I just want to bring to the attention of the board that the those who will be attending the Community College Association of Texas Trustees Conference this week, there will be a legislative overview. <clears throat> and any handouts that come out of that, we'll make sure Natalie distributes electronically to all the board members so we all have benefit of that legislative update, even if you're not able to attend the conference. Yeah, absolutely. It's really great timing that we're going to be at, at the CAT conference Thursday through Saturday. So um, that'll give us, uh, I think, a good overview of what's happening um, with our community colleges. And on that note, uh, the United Corpus Christi Chamber of Commerce, I'm going to give you this, uh, this date and then I'll send you the information. It came out today. They're going to be having a community update on all of the uh, TWIA reform that has uh, been significant in this session. And that is going to be May 26th at 10 a.m. May? I'm sorry, June 26th, <laughs> we missed it. June 26th at 10 a.m. at the uh, Ortiz Center, and I'll send you that invitation. And then in August, um, the chamber is also going to do a comprehensive uh, workshop um, about the whole legislative update for the Coastal Bend area as well. So we'll have that to look forward to in August. Uh, just really quickly, Regents, um, I would just like to Thank you, Natalie. It's an excellent yeah. report. Um, the overall effort at this, this year's um, legislative session was quite different uh, than, than the uh, five sessions prior that I've ever experienced. And we have really received uh, great uh, attention and with all sincerity coming from, from the state's leadership. And I think in ways that I've never, ex that I've never seen before, and I, I dare say that the association has never experienced before. Um, more to come on that and as well as I go into my summer meetings and I go to my quarterly meeting tomorrow and the, the annual meeting in July I'll come back with some more reports and as, as all of this becomes uh, completely solidified because as Ms. Villarreal said there the governor still has till Sunday to to um, act upon legislation 
Just quickly, the, the tax cap bill for us, for, for community colleges to remain carved out is a major, major deal and a major undertaking. That's the prime example of what I'm talking about here. Um, the other thing is you know, the transfer bill that's really around the core curriculum. We still have work. We still have work to do. It's not done. Um, as Ms. Villarreal said, that the um, uh, universities and the, and, the, and the community colleges are going to come together and uh, through the coordinating board come up with some rules around that and, and have more discussion about what the core curriculum looks like. It remains whole at 42 hours. Uh, my first question of this whole conversation was what happened to 60 hours in the community colleges, but uh, we know that that's not been the case for some time. Uh, but the fact that we, um, we remain uh, where we started at the beginning of the session um, is, is a good, um, is a solid outcome. Again, those are just two solid indicators as to the effort um, that was put forth by the leadership of, of TAC and CAT and others um, to really have what we think was a really solid outcome. Um, we know there's still grounds to be made and still relationships to be forged uh, into the future. And um, like I said, I'll have some following, uh, some follow-up um, conversations and updates to you all as a board, um, probably after the July meeting. Any other questions or comments? If not, we'll move on to our budget update. Uh, Mr. Garcia, do you have any opening comments, Dr. Escamilla? No, not, not, not for this. Mr. Garcia is going to jump right in. <laughs> okay, Madam Scott, Mr. President, members of the Board of Regents, good afternoon. Uh, I have for you a budget status update. Um, the process started uh, back in February with the uh, uh, approval of the tuition increase and a kickoff meeting uh, with the various stakeholders. At the kickoff meeting, the stakeholders were asked to plan for a flat funding for office supplies, food and beverage and travel. This was done intentionally uh, to safeguard against uh, legislative threats uh, to existing revenues. As we know today, uh, it's gotten a little bit better. Uh, the proposed budget has been under development since February and has been vetted multiple times in an effort to best align revenues and expenses and strategic initiatives. In addition, budget requests have been reviewed against the Strategic Annual Unit Assessment Report at each department level. Further review will continue as the appropriation and tax revenues become more definitive in the coming weeks. More to come on that. Let's take a cl closer look. All right. Okay, let's start with uh, operating revenues. Using the 2019 annual op operating budget as a reference point or anything else, uh, property taxes, tuition, and fees, and state appropriation makes up 93% of the overall revenue budget, 93%. Keep in mind, property tax and state appropriations is still cooking. We won't know that until coming weeks. Uh, the college at anticipates similar trends in the fiscal year 2020 annual budget. Interesting enough, property tax and appropriation makes up 69% of the revenue. Again, it will become more definitive in the coming weeks. Okay, more on the three major revenue streams. <laughs> Going into the 86th legis legislative session this year, House Bill 1 was the biggest threat to the college long-term financial uh, sustainability. Thanks to corroborating legislative efforts by the board, our president, and many more, uh, community college are no longer included in this bill. The pending, this is pending the governor's approval, by the way, so we'll again, we'll know a little bit more in a couple of days. With that said, we are planning for a change of $3.1 million for a total of $57.8 million uh, uh, from last year's $54.7 million just on uh, property taxes alone. Moving on to tuition. Uh, we are anticipating a change in tuition of revenue of approximately $860,000. This is attributed to the $3 semester hour tuition change. Uh, that was approved a few months ago in the increase in tuition. The new semester hour rate is $67 uh, per credit hour rate for a new total of uh, 
in total revenues, 25.7 million, up from 24.8 million for fiscal year 2019. State appropriations. Based on the most recent state funding proposal, the college is anticipating 600,000 change in funding, 1.2 million for the two years. So I'm just focusing on the one year. So let's talk about the tenant of state appropriation dollars. The college is hopeful that in the coming days, the governor will approve the proposed funding for a total of 1.2 million to be distributed over the two fiscal years. It is important to note that 75% of the $1.2 million came in the form of success points. This seems to suggest that the state transition, uh, transitioning into a student success funding modeling in the coming years. If this continues, this may be a big game changer uh, in how we do business in the com coming years. And I think earlier this morning we talked about the strategic vision. We're already touching on some of these things. We are already preparing ourselves for this uh, potential possible change that may come in the near future. If you look at this chart, you'll see that overall, my uh, contact hour, which is the gray bar, is um, a little bit on the, remain pretty much flat right here. But if you look at my student success points, you see that big bump right there? It's going up. That means this year, uh, the state made a conscious decision to fund more on student success. 75% of this extra funding that came in this year, all geared towards student success. Well, it, it's, it's the payback for production. Mm -hmm. It's not targeted towards student success. It is, it is performance-based funding based on our student success. Yes. I'm just gonna make sure that we all understand that terminology. <laughs> Great, thank you. <laughs> um, so let's talk about contact hour change, which is always a common uh, subject uh, over, the, uh, over the coming months. Uh, the contact hour rate changes from $5.40 to $5.44. There is no change in our core operations. The success point rate changes from $171.56 to $202.53. Please take note that this is a biennium rate. If you want to get the annualized rate, you just got to cut it in half. Very important. So all of a sudden everybody thinks we're rich and no. <laughs> We're not. <laughs> okay. Next is operating expenses. Using the 2019 annual operating budget as a reference point, salary and benefits accounts for the lion's share of expenses with 74 million uh, of, of the, uh, or 75% of the total budget. The next big ticket items include computer services, utilities, <laughs> supplies and other services for 16.5 million. Due to changes in the college priorities, the college is anticipating slight changes in these categories in the 2020 budget due to uh, the priorities identified in the strategic initiatives that were discussed earlier this morning. So let's, let's try to bridge it all together in the next slide. Can I ask you a question, Earl? Yes, do we fund any part of the employee's retirement or do, do they do it themselves through TRS? You know, I'm still trying to get my arms around that, but this is what little I know at this point in time. I think it's a, a three-part funding mechanism of which the, uh, the institution has and bills for its total value. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. the Jamie's walking up so she knows you. Quietly. Um, it is, it's the, the, um, the state sets the percent rate, um, the state legislature does for TRS and also the optional retirement plan. So they set the rate for the employee's contribution and they also set the rate for the employer contribution. On the employer contribution, part of it is funded by the state. I think TRS, it's it might be about a fourth. They, they participate maybe about a fourth of, and then Delmar, Delmar funds the remaining amount. So is our portion included in the uh, employee salaries in here? 
in the, in the graph? No, our portion is on the uh, slice that shows employee benefits. Okay. So that would not only be, those would be benefits that are paid by Delmar. That would not include the benefits that um, are like paid solely by the employee. So this would be Delmar's expense. So it would be retirement. It could be our share of medical insurance. It could be um, we pay long-term disability and life for employees. So it would be those types of benefits. Okay. Thank you. What's the difference between the uh, optional and the other retirement, the ORP or optional retirement program? Um, What's the difference? Well, if the state allows you to have an optional retirement plan and it can be offered to uh, any full-time faculty in certain administrative positions, but they have some rules. I mean, once you're in TRS, then you stay in TRS. Um, a TRS plan is an annuity plan, so basically it's, def it's a defined benefit. So you're, if you retire, you're gonna get a retirement check every month, you know, in, 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 until until uh, whatever sediment, uh, setup you have for your annuity. On the optional retirement plan, I think you can, if you're familiar with like with 401k plans in the private sector, it's what they call a defined contribution, which means you just put a certain amount in and you have uh, an account with just a full dollar amount in it. You don't draw a specific retirement check. If, if you put X amount of dollars in and Delmar puts X amount of dollars in, then when you retire with the optional retirement plan, then you have access to that full amount of cash. Um, and you also have the ability to invest it the way the employee wants to invest it. So it goes up and down with however, whatever investments you choose. TRS, it goes into the state fund. The employee does not invest it. The state handles that. And it's a guaranteed <coughs> retirement check. Okay, Tammy, thank you. Uh, let me just say, it, it, uh, it takes a village, right? <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so let's bridge the uh, financial resources to strategic initiatives. Uh, the college is in the final stages of developing the five-year strategic plan that will provide the college with a roadmap of priorities. The most recent draft of the strategic plan includes goals for student completion, student recruitment and persistence, learning environments, and workforce development, community, and advocacy. Embedded in our 2020 budget plan is $4.3 million in financial support for these initiatives. And I've listed you a couple of those examples. More to come. Mr. Garcia. Yes. Is there a reason why you left out the goal three academic preparation? Uh, well, uh, I learned a lot this morning and I think I could have probably put a lot more in here, uh, but this was just a little taste and flavor of more to come in next month's uh, uh, workshop. That'll be a little bit more comprehensive and I'll do my best to put everything as much as I can and link it up to all the different uh, talking points. But there was really no reason, no, no bias. It was just, okay, let me find something to see what makes sense. Because you would think that goal three would be one that would require a lot of money. You also left up more gold six, but I'm not worried about I, that because that's yours. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> uh, I agree. And, and maybe I'm saving the sticker shock for last. I think that's what it is. So yeah, let, I appreciate it. Let me it. just make a request that when you bring, uh, as you can, as you and the, the rest of the, the village uh, continue to, <laughs> to uh, work on these strategic uh, initiative funding mechanisms, under fully implement the DMC Police Department. Dr. Scamia, if you could just make sure that when we talk about that, we bring new regents up to speed on our three-year three -year plan to, to implement that. I think that those of us who've been here understand the high price tag, but others of you might look at that and go, what? So I think we need to make sure we tell that complete story. Yes, so. <laughs> okay. Very nice, okay. Thank you for your input. All right, next item. Um, so let's talk about uh, categories, um, the other side of the coin. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, I pointed out a couple of critical things in our operations, salaries, benefits, uh, the Southside campus. Uh, from a cost category perspective, the 2020 budget includes a, a change of funding of about $3.8 million under these different categories. More to come again in, in next month's uh, more comprehensive presentation. So let's talk about next steps. 
A more comprehensive budget workshop is scheduled for July 11, followed by the most critical point in the process, and that is uh, the budget approval and tax rate approvals, and th that's to come in the month of August. So I laid out a couple of dates, um, and uh, please take note of those specific dates. You, you guys play a very critical role in this final phase. Uh, so our, our workshop on July 9th will be a pretty robust workshop on the budget because that will be our last opportunity for the board to have significant input and questions into the budget prior to having to publish the tax rate notice. So that will need to be a pretty robust discussion. It will definitely be a, a, a more robust discussion. Just keep in mind that I really won't get the strong numbers from our tax proposal. Uh, appropriations and, and, and the tax dollars until after this session so we may talk about uh, some critical needs but keep in mind that you know we need to deliver a balanced budget and we sort of try to have to squeeze out all the priorities and the dollars and balance that out at the end of the day right. so yes For, from a from what I recall from previous processes we get an early indication but we understand that that it's not final till it's final Yes, and so what we may, may do is have the discussion around based on early indications here's what we're budgeting if it comes plus here's where we will add the addition if it ends up negative here's where we'll take take the money from and that, again I just I, looking at your calendar we don't really have if, if we've got to have a called meeting on August 5th to order the public hearings on budget and tax rates those budget and tax rates have to be set by August August 5th so it's a tight schedule right. very tight right. interesting enough for what represents I think I said 65% of our revenue stream I mean that that's mm -hmm. that's unique <laughs> do we yes. anticipate a workshop on the 13th or just a board meeting August 13th I'm sorry what was your question again your workshop that morning on go back August to the, the calendar 13th. oh go, okay go back to the uh, yes on the 11th um, no 13th uh, I'm sorry the, August. the third August. Not, not likely typically the, the meetings uh, are, are around um, the scheduled meetings there to get us through the budget for the budget process so, no, no so far there. so far we don't anticipate one for the for the month of uh, August you talk about just in general yeah let me see it on, on my notes I'll try to answer that question for you when we get okay. to calendar okay so our budget workshop on July the 9th is at 10:30. Is that correct? That sounds right. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's the regular July meeting. We're trying to compile as much as we can condense as much as we can into work one working day. As opposed, it, it, this calendar was different than the last than last year's calendar where we had separate uh, standalone workshops. And so we're trying to combine them just like we did today with strategic planning. It'll be some version of that. Maybe not as much time in the morning. Maybe an hour and a half, maybe two at the most, but uh, we're trying to combine them all with the regularly scheduled meetings. Other than those required by by law for tax notice of notifications and those sorts of things, we're going to try to stick to um, keeping the only the necessary amounts of of meeting times. Other questions, comments for Mr. Garcia? <coughs> nope. All right. I, uh, oh. okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. I. Uh, you know, I'll go back to these contact hours that we're talking about, and I know I've brought it up before, but now you say, let's say <clears throat> we're talking about five something now, five dollars and something. Is that for what? Just any any class or any course or whatever? How does that work? Uh, well, it's not just any class. It's for most of our classes. Like the remedial classes, I think the formula, funding formula is slightly different. Okay. Okay, let's just say the regular classes. And of course, some of them have a lab, so it may be a little more, right? Okay, but let's say English, math, history. I mean, a kid goes to, or a young man goes to that class every day. So every day he's gonna generate contact money to the school? Well, keep in mind, it's a very complex funding formula. And it's based on historical contact hours. So uh, a student sitting in a classroom today uh, will be taking it to consideration in the following biannual funding stream and it's calculated and so when I say five dollars you know that's where we end up at the end of the day once the uh, different uh, once the, the state says I have X amount of dollars 
and here's the points and credit contact our production and let's work the numbers and guess what it falls at five dollars doesn't necessarily mean that if you go to the store similar to you going to the store if you see five five dollars you're gonna you, you're gonna pay five dollars it doesn't work with that state with the state it's a little bit different they work the numbers backwards yeah, and i think i was going to answer oh, yeah. that's okay well um a contact hour every course has a different number of hours that they actually have contact or meet and so every course has a formula as to if it's a three college credit hour lecture hour it's roughly three hours times three times a week at 16 weeks or whatever it, it, for the number of hours that they actually meet and right. then there's a formula that that's plugged in your technical courses pay at a certain rate and your lecture hours classes pay at a certain rate and so the five dollars and forty cents is basically an average that comes back to the college over that whole pool yeah yeah and i understand all of that because you know it's got to you know be different different things okay but what i'm saying is for example the contact hours like you said <coughs> okay so then when will we know or do we know how much money was generated because of contact hours last year or you know things like this because that's going to be important in the future for me yes sir we do in that the base year started fundamentally last summer of 2018 and so all the hours that ge were generated through the college through all coursework that would be funded from the last summer of 18 through this spring of 2019 that's set and so that's what we'll be paid on those contact hours for the next two years for the budget year 2019 and the budget year 2020. So those contact hours are set, that, those dollars. Once we know this summer, then we'll know what they are. Yeah, now, you, you mentioned forward looking. Uh, I would say contact hours is definitely important. You know, I'll go back to the schedule. You know, it, it brings the lion's share of our revenue, but at the same t token, the opportunity is really on the success points. That's where the world is going in, in, in that's what I'm seeing today, in my opinion. Success point, performance-driven type of funding. And that's where, we, in my opinion, I think we need to focus our attention strategically and keep our eye on the ball. The big dollars are important, don't get me wrong, but if we want to get ahead of the curve uh, and be competitive, success, success points relative to, to performance is gonna be critical in our business. <clears throat> and of course, you know, the the individuals being here in school and <laughs> the more people we have here the more contact hours also we're going to get so i can see that you know also but <clears throat> i just uh i kind of want to get more or less an idea how much you know in the past has happened as far as the contact money has come in well it, more or less more or less. yeah it does help but let me give you another example back in 2010 uh, our appropriation dollars was about 15 million and we were probably hitting the contact hours. But guess what? The recession kicked in, and the state lopped off $2 million. So, so yes, you know, it, it's so many variables that we need to keep an, an eye, our eye on the ball and anticipate uh, those uh, shocks to the system, as well as making sure that we are recruiting and retaining students. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, our last staff report is going to be on the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board 60 by 30 strategic plan update. Dr. Wilson. Hello again. Good afternoon, Regents. I'm here to provide an update on the 60 by 30 plan. The 60 by 30 TX plan is a strategic plan for the State of Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board and higher education in general. It launched in uh, 2015, so it's just a few years old. This afternoon, I'm gonna be providing you with some data. The last time you looked at this was this exact same time last year, so we do have some comparison data for you. There are four goals within the strategic plan with statewide targets. There are also three regional targets. On your screen right now, you see the state of Texas and the different regions there are the regions as defined by the coordinating board. As you can see, South Texas is the largest. They consider South Texas to be San Antonio all the way down to the valley. 
So we are included in this very large group. Um, that can be a little challenging because it's, it's such a wide and diverse area. But as I'll share in just a few minutes, we have been working with partners in this region to help to, uh, to uh, further these goals. Okay, so here are the four goals. Goal one, educated population. Go to goal two, completion. Those two are slightly different, similar, but slightly different. Goal three is marketable skills. And goal four is student debt. As we go through the next slides, you'll see that there are different targets. Some of them are for the state, some for, for our South, Te South Texas region, and a couple for Del Mar College. So I just wanna make, wanna make sure you make note of that as we go through the slides, you'll see the different designations. Goal one, 460 by 30 TX, and the one that we hear the most about is the educated population goal. This is um, the goal which gives the plan its name. By 2030, at least 60% of Texans ages 25 to 34 will have a certificate or degree. That's the goal statewide by 2030. And as you can see on your screen, there are gradual benchmarks to get us there. When the plan started in 2015, we were at 41% statewide. As of 2017, this is the most recent data that we have, we move that needle slightly statewide. But as you can see, this is gonna take a, a greater effort amongst the state um, to meet this goal. This is an interesting metric in and of itself because it's survey data. This is um, compiled from the census survey, the American Community Survey, so it's a sample. So not every Texan is, is, um, is surveyed. This is basically an estimation of what they think. So uh, we're moving the needle, but again, it's not a perfect measure. Within our region, we have slightly different targets for this particular goal, goal one. By 2030, at least 47% of South Texans will have a certificate or degree. They changed or they um, adjusted those targets based on where we are starting. So some of the metropolitan areas, we each have a heavy lift to meet our goals, but Dallas, for instance, has a higher um, education attainment rate, so, so they're starting a little bit higher. So here in South Texas, we started at 33.3% in 2015, and we've gone up just slightly in a couple of years. Have, a, have some work to do. This is, again, a funny metric. I can't give you this data for Del Mar College. This is a regional survey, so I can't get that to you, but we're, we're moving in the right direction. But as you can see, more work to be done. Is that a, you can't get that information today, or it's not ever going to be available? Correct, it, it won't be available. Um, what I could do, we could possibly look at various um, city groupings, but the way it's produced, it's a, it's a survey throughout the state, and the best that they do, the best that they provide it to us is regionally. Is there a metric based on census data, based on something else that can give us a ballpark, or you wouldn't recommend a ballpark versus whatever methodology they use? Right, it, okay. it's completely different. And, to okay. tell you the truth, it's a pretty strange methodology. I understand the validity or the usefulness of a survey, but because the sample size is so small, they really only survey a few, like a couple thousand people a year. It's hard to, it's hard to know how accurate it is. Based on survey, it's not yes. based on actual data. Yes, okay. and that's that's a yes, yes. So um, it's good data, interesting data, but it is a survey. It's a sample survey based on the census every year. So again, just a few thousand people complete it. We can it. get it for Nueces County, right? We probably can get it by county, which would if give you'd us like a, to see it. Yeah. Closer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because South Texas includes San Antonio, the valley, a huge yeah. region. Yes. Mm -hmm. that, and and I th again, with the caveat that this is not the same methodology that is used to report to coordinating board, but I think that would be mm -hmm. um, useful for us to just get a sense of how far off we are in real data versus the survey data. Right. And actually, it would still be survey data. It would just be honing in on our particular oh, county. Same methodology, just yes. by county. Okay. And what's interesting about it is it's a snapshot. So it doesn't mean that it's somebody who got their degree here. It could be somebody that moved here. It's just a right. snapshot of, of all residents. Well, they tell yeah, it's not an institutional measure at all. No. <laughs> okay. 
Okay. Will they give you the information on how many people from Nueces County were surveyed? Yes. So that likely will be a very small number if Probably the so. entire survey. So I'm not sure how helpful it will be. Right. Yep, with surveys like that, I'm sure they, they distribute it widely, but it all depends on what they get back. It's an interesting metric. Would this information be available, let's say, with the Census Bureau after the next census? Yes, and actually this particular survey is issued every year, so it is updated every year on the Census website. So it's not a part of the 10-year of the census process, but it is an instrument of the U.S. Census Bureau. Okay. This next measure is a lot more helpful, a lot more accurate for us. Goal two, completion. By 2030, at least 550,000 certificates and degrees will be awarded in Texas. So this is a specific metric that we can tie to our institution. So statewide, the goal, again, 500 and 550, 550,000 by 2030. In 2015, we were at a little over 311,000 and that needle has moved. This is the most recent data. So we're making good progress. Um, South Texas, again, this is just a piece of that pie. By 2030, we wanna have a little over 93,000 certificates and degrees awarded. We've had some progress, but we're hovering around that 51,000 within our region. So some progress being made, but we're kind of going up and down around 51,000. On the other hand, you should be really, really happy to see this, and this is in line with what Dr. Escamilla shared earlier today. Um, we do have institutional targets to help our region and our state to meet this goal. Uh, there's our 2015 target, um, or our 2015 actual and our 2030 target. We've made significant progress in this regard, and we've actually already um, surpassed our 2020 target. So good work, good work to us, all of our faculty and staff. We are awarding more uh, degrees and certificates than we ever had before at a rate that's higher than, than the state and the region. Okay, very exciting. All right, um, again, goal two, um, high school to um, institutions of higher education target. There's a specific um, metric statewide that by 2030, at least 65% of all Texas public high school graduates will enroll in an institution of higher education in Texas by the first fall after high school. Ooh, that's a mouthful. <laughs> so in 2016, we were at 52%, and we are the same statewide. That has not changed. Yep. Within South Texas, um, again, that target's a little, it's adjusted slightly. By 2030, we'll be at 64%, and we've gone up just slightly. This is a tricky one. We know that our students come to us when they're ready to come to us. This particular metric is challenging because we know, again, our students have, have different plans, and this is very specific that they're looking at high school graduation and enrollment that fall. So this is another one we look at it regionally. We could look at it within our, within our um, county, but I don't have that for you today. That's not something that the state compiles. So what's the methodology to get this information? Um, this, the state looks at the, the actual students who graduate and then they check, they check enrollment throughout the state to see if they enroll directly that fall. So if a student enrolls over the summer and doesn't come back in the fall, they're not counted. It's only um, completion than enrollment in the fall. So that and metric, ask, go ahead, sorry. It's actually available by high school. Okay. So you can look at which high school's students are graduating and then enrolling in the next fall. And there's a wide variation in Nueces County. Mm -hmm. So there's a, this metric could not only inform this report, but it could inform our recruitment goal and our strategic plan. If we know exactly where we've got capacity and what high schools need propping up to help move those students into an institution of higher education, that could inform our recruitment. Definitely. Goal. Yeah. We can see which, which schools need, the, need more support. You can also see where they went. Um, you know, from each specific high school, you can see did they come to Del Mar College? Did they go to AM Corpus Christi? Did, as long as it's in the state, mm -hmm. you can see where they went. Mm -hmm. 
we will be having a strategic enrollment management meeting, getting ready for the next um, funding cycle, and just getting ready for enrollment in general. Likely, in the beginning of next month, we're already Dr. Silva and I are already working on that very thing to dissect the very segments of, of the population of the student population to understand where the opportunities are um, as they still present themselves. As, as we said many times, and we were talking about over lunch, that just the, um, the how how our numbers are set out and how the different segments of the popula their student population affect um, our, our overall numbers is, is, um, is quite interesting. So using the uh, dual credit students, for instance, if you just, if you just control for that group and, 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 and study the other, the other uh, student population, you'll get different data as if you, you know, meld everybody together, put everybody in one bucket and treat them that way. So those are things we're going to be studying as we, as we move ahead. And so the TEA, um, as well as I think, uh, I'm trying to think where the other website is that has this, the other, the other database that has this, but um, we'll be watching, we'll be using all this data. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about it with our regional partners as well. All right, goal three, marketable skills. By 2030, all graduates from Texas public institutions will have completed programs with identified marketable skills. Right now, every single program currently has program learning outcomes. We're working on making sure that students understand what those are so that they can market themselves to employers so they know this is what I learned, this is, um, these are my skill sets, this is what I can do for you. So this particular metric that the state looks at is students found working or enrolled one year after receiving an award. And as you can see, Del Mar has exceeded this target for several years. The target is 80% and we consistently exceed it. I know, <laughs> yep, we're gonna celebrate our successes. This is a topic of conversation as well this morning, goal four, student debt. By 2030, no more than half of all students who earn an undergraduate degree or certificate will have debts. Here at Del Mar College, we, um, our students, only 33% of our graduates have debt, which is significantly below the statewide average. Okay, so we're doing a great job there. <laughs> These targets, we've discussed some of the challenges with the targets, the challenges with the fact that um, the state is looking at us as a region, a very diverse, distinct region. So within South Texas, we've divided ourselves up into three different groups. There's the San Antonio South Texas group, the middle South Texas group, which we're a part of. There's also um, a group from, from the Valley. So our group is working together, looking at these four goals, looking at our challenges, especially, you know, we, we talked a few minutes ago about recruitment from high schools. This is a, a regional effort. How can we promote the value of higher education? How can we leverage our resources to do this very well? So our particular group includes Corpus Christi, Beeville, Kingsville, Victoria, Del Rio, and Laredo. And collectively, we came together and we realized that we need to look at the entire student pathway experience. <laughs> so as a region, we're actually looking at, th at four different strategies. We want to make sure that we effectively connect students to higher education, no matter their starting point. So if they start directly from high school, if they are in a continuing education program, or if they're a returning student, we wanna make sure that we are, we are effectively showing them what we have to offer. While they're here with us, we also want to advise them effectively, assess their intent, give them the correct advising. As a region, we're also looking at a marketing campaign in which we can promote the value of higher education right after high school. And then finally, if you look at that far end um, of the pathway, number two, the next steps. Every student's next step is different, but we wanna make sure that we have clear connections from um, the community colleges to the university, to workforce, and also to advanced degrees after they're um, through with the university. Okay. So it is complicated and complex work. We have been collaborating with our partners and I'm really happy to share that we've taken a lead in this regard. And this past March, we hosted our regional partners here. There will be continued collaborations. The next one will be this fall in Kingsville. So these are collective um, challenges that we face and we figure that the best way to, to tackle them is together. 
So as you can see, we're making progress on various indicators. Some still need a lot of work, but um, this is very well aligned with our strategic plan, and I know we'll only continue to make progress. Any questions? Who would be considered regional partners? Sure. So within our middle South Texas, because the South Texas group is really large, we tried to break that down. So here within Corpus, we have um, Texas A&M, um, University Corpus Christi, also um, University of Incarnate Word, ourselves. We have Coastal Bend College in Beeville, uh, Texas A&M University, Kingsville, Victoria College, and U of H Victoria. Um, there's also a satellite of the, um, uh, what is the campus that's in Alpine? Sol Ross. Sol Ross, that's it. Sol Ross has a campus in Del Rio, so they've been joining us as well. And then Laredo Community College and Texas A&M International University in Laredo. So there's quite a few. So it's, it's kind of strange how they grouped us, San Antonio all the way down. That's <coughs> almost an unworkable group, but we're communicating within the whole region and very extensively within Middle South Texas. Yeah, people who drew these maps aren't from South Texas. <laughs> There's, I, I want to thank Dr. Wilson and, and the team um, for leading the charge. Um, we were recognized as a forerunner by the state. We're really doing a lot to work with the coordinating board to lead those efforts. Um, it is our obligation to come back to you at least once a year, and that's what we intend to do. We intend to come back next year this time, maybe, maybe sooner if something dramatic happens for reporting purposes, but we want to continue to update you um, uh, on the 60 by 30 plan. It is our commitment to, to the state, the governor, and in the leadership of the state of Texas will, is watching this, this plan very intently. Um, I will add that there was legislation that was um, crafted, although it didn't uh, come to fruition, that would affect uh, the outcomes for 60 by 30. Uh, there's talk out there, and I think uh, next session it's going to have a, a little bit of a, um, um, a head of steam to, uh, uh, to, to, bring it, to bring it to fruition, and that is to include uh, some con continuing education and non-credit uh, um, um, points and so forth and contact hours and so forth. And so there was already discussions at this last, les last legislative session to include that. They didn't quite make it, though. But uh, stay tuned. Like any strategic plan, I, I'm happy to hear that the, uh, the state, too, is remaining flexible and that there may be changes to come to the basic structure of the 60 by 30 plan. Well, one of the headlines I see coming out of this is that every place that we have an institutional specific measure, we have exceeded our targets. So I think that is incredible that, that, that is incredible that every place we have an institutional measure, we have exceeded our targets to date. Good work. Thank you. Okay, uh, we will now look, uh, hear from our uh, president on his uh, regular, regular report. Uh, very quickly, just a couple of re uh, reports, Regents. And as, as, as we talked about earlier, I'm really proud of our, our spring graduation. Uh, it was an honor to have Dr. Kelly Quintanilla be our keynote speaker. It was a wonderful celebration. And I'm proud to report that we will be submitting 800, the number 808 uh, graduates for degrees and certificates for completion for this spring graduation, as we stated earlier, which is the largest spring graduating um, class so far. So if, as you felt, as you saw uh, the participants in that particular, um, at, 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 on that particular day in that, that arena, I've never seen anything like it. Um, again, the head count for participations of attendees was 6,958. So what I'm saying is, you know, not only is it growing, you know, we're, we are going to be moving this summer for the first time. We'll be moving out of the Richardson because even our summer graduations are growing. Our fall graduations are growing. And, 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 and so to accommodate our students and their families uh, completely and relative to the size of the graduating class, um, we've um, leased the Selena Auditorium, which is just that mid-size, something just bigger than the Richardson, so that we don't have to worry about uh, restricting students who are excited, who are going to bring, you know, who are going to have a wonderful family gathering um, on that particular day. We're going to offer them that opportunity to come and and uh, bring as many as they want, and we think uh, that the Selena helps us do that. So. Again, kind of looking forward, Selena, graduation, first time um, this summer. 
Um, and what, oh, and let me also add for the summer graduation, I know we're only talking about spring, but this includes summer. Um, we'll have the faculty, um, we'll have it set up such the faculty will be uh, on on the floor in the, in the seats rather than behind us on the stage like we did in Richardson. This, it's a much more um, accommodating and much more a celebratory, comfortable atmosphere. So that's all, these are all symptoms of, first of all, doing the right things by, by all involved and, and some growth um, at, at, the, at those uh, particular events. The other thing, just quickly, Regents, this past weekend, uh, both June 7th and 8th was the, I said the seventh annual, it's actually the sixth annual Stringers for Scholarships. Again, there too, we had more teams than ever. We had 58 teams uh, apply and, and participate. Uh, the year before, I think we had 44 or something like that. And so big numbers. This also set a record. Um, I know we grossed a little over 70,000. We're still doing the accounting to, to find out what that yield is on that net. But it was an absolute, just a wonderfully hot day. Very, very hot. Um, but, um, the best so far, and I like how we just keep growing there as well. Participants, um, people winning, winning prizes and winning cash prizes and all this, donating them back to the to the foundation was just wonderful to see. Uh, just a lot of fun, of all ages, families and so forth. It's my it's one of my favorite events. Uh, that concludes my report. Well, I wanted to bring up um, Dr. Quintanilla's uh, gift to the. 2019 spring graduating class. Uh, would you yes. like to mention that? No, no, go ahead, please. Well, please. I just, I, I wanted, for those of you who weren't there, uh, she gave a minimum $500 scholarship to every graduate in 2019, for spring 2019. If you had a 3.0 or higher, it was a $1,000 scholarship. And if you had a 3.5 or higher, it was a four, is that correct? $4,000 scholarship. What an incredible offer to our students. Yes. I heard, a no, I heard a couple of folks saying, is she going to do that every <laughs> semester? <laughs> so the envy has already started, but what a, what a gift uh, that the university and, and the, the Texas A&M Islander Foundation, uh, I assume, is the funding source for that, and they have, they have come through for our students, and, and what a gift for those students who intend to transfer, and a recruitment tool for, for students who maybe not had, had thought that that wasn't, wasn't in their future, but that was an incredible gift, and I wanted to make sure that we acknowledge that. And, Good, good job, Dr. Eskami, in asking her to do that. See, <laughs> you know, see, see every spring, you she, every spring if she wants to do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she told me 10 minutes before this presentation, so uh, <laughs> did not know that. But thank you, Dr. Quintanilla. Thank yeah. you, Texas A&M University, Corpus Christi. That was pretty incredible. Dr. Eskami, perhaps I misunderstood, but you talked about the Stillian Auditorium for graduations. What is the possibility, and this may be a crazy question, of waiving the parking fees for the families? Mm. There's like a ten dollar fee to park. I will look into that. I, I, I'm not sure. I'll have to check our agreement with the with the um, with the uh, um, American Bank Center. But Dr. Silva, can you? And and again, the the parking fees by the American Bank Center. I think they're charging five dollars per. So it's nothing that comes to the college. I just want to make sure that's straight. <laughs> um, so yeah, we'd have to make five some arrangements. Each. Probably, I'm sure American Bank Center is still going to want to get that kind of money. That's where they make their revenues. So yeah. we'd have to have a discussion further with, with them. Yeah. yeah, we'll have to look into future contracts to see how how those can how that can possibly be arranged. It is a five dollar per vehicle, not a ten dollar. Five dollar per vehicle. Um, item will 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 take it under advisement and uh, we'll look into it next Just time. Just asking. Yes, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. you. We explored that and someone no. pays it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Either Everybody the college pays. pays it or the or the family yeah. pays it. Let's just ask it. Thank you. I think so. Yeah. They have to pay too. So in, uh, next item is our pending business. So in your uh, board packet was a list of pending items that will be coming before the board. Uh, in July, we'll have our quarterly financial and investment reports. Uh, July or August, we're going to have our annual um, review of all the, the tax abatements and kind of the, the, where are we in any tax abatements that we have, have issued in the last several years. In August, uh, an interim report on the grant management audit, uh, and then you'll see the rest of the updates coming up. If there's something that you have uh, requested or would, would like to remind us of, let me know, and we'll make sure it gets on the pending list for future meetings. I try to keep track on my on my on notes. The, on the tax abatement 
report where we have somebody from EDC doing that? that yes. That's what we're trying to schedule. That's he's, why it's July he's, or August. Yeah. <laughs> he's, here today on, he's here today on another item, but that's what oh, we're trying to get scheduled. Yeah. Yeah, he's here early. Uh, Mike, I guess you heard that request. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be looking for you to help us out. We're trying to get that scheduled. Okay, moving on to our consent agenda. We're going to consider approval of minutes from our May board meeting and acceptance of our investment report uh, from May uh, and April, investments and financials. Um, are there any items that need to be removed for separate consideration? Can, can we speak about the um, balance sheet and the check register? Okay, so you want to pull both, is that on item three? That's item two and three? The April 30th balance sheet. Gotcha, so that would be uh, number three, okay? We'll move pull that for separate consideration. Move to approve the other sheet. Sure. Moved, um, Mr. Rebus made a motion to approve items one and two. Is there a second? Second. Second by Dr. Sherwood, is that, is that correct? Uh, any public comment on that consent, those consent agenda items? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. Okay, you have a question on those items. Can you refer us to a page or? I can. Uh, on the check register, uh, I've got a question on the check to GCA services. What page is that? It looks like. It's very bottom. Page 56. 56. That's a $91,000 check. Is that a $10,000 increase over prior months? That's for our custodial services. Okay. So you have to do some research into that? We'll have to do some research into this. Let me make sure we got the right one. We get the right number on that one. I know Kathy and Roll are here. She's gone, okay. The next question on that one is, when, when does that contract expire? I don't have that off the top of my head. Do you have that contract date, Kathy? I mean, uh, Tammy? Yeah, Mr. Alfonso is the one who has that, on the, and he's not here today. So we'll, we'll, we'll get that. We'll have to get that for you, Mr. And, and my concern there is, for $91,000, can we not hire our own people, put employees in place as custodians, as opposed to contracting out with some out-of-state entity? And we've talked about this before. Um, I, I would just personally prefer to have employees as opposed to paying somebody in excess of a million dollars a year to be a custodian that um, is not even from here. Okay. Duly noted on the uh, comment commentary, but specifically on the dollars, um, there's a variance that you're asking about. I, I'm used to an eighty-two thousand dollar check, and this one looks like variance it's of about uh, a less than ten thousand. Less than ten thousand that we're going to look into for you. Okay, we're making note of that. We'll have to do our um, due diligence on that. There was another item. There is. Um, I think Mr. Garcia can help us with this one. That $86 million net pension liability on the balance sheet, that's almost the cost of the buildings on the South Campus Phase 1. And I'm wondering what that represents. I, I think the board needs to know. I need to be clar have clarification on it. It looks to me like that's expenses that have been incurred in past years that haven't been paid. Mr. Garcia, am I following this correctly? Uh, I would say I have a different perspective. Um, I would say that the pension and liability is driven by actuarial factors. It's dependent on the return on your investment on the full dollars on the state pension, by the way. Let me emphasize that. It's dependent on the life expectancy of the individual. It is dependent on uh, the number of retirees coming out of the system the number of new employees coming into the system. It's a very complex modeling, and it's actually existed prior to it coming on board on our financial statements. Now, what does that mean? The state has always reported this as a liability. It hasn't been an issue then, 
and I don't think it's an issue today. Uh, it is a liability. I don't have to pay it today, just like a mortgage. You know, um, I think we all have mortgages. We, uh, we opted to pay it over a period of time to manage the cash outlay. And same thing here. You know, the, the state actuaries will come in and say, this is the cost that you need to pay into the system today to maintain or sustain the fund. And we've been paying that on a timely basis. But Does that help? This is not for future services. This is for past services. It, it is based on, it is a formula driven liability uh, based on uh, the number of years that a person uh, has been service, has been uh, of service to the state. That is correct. Yes. Like any other pension. Yes. So, so we've incurred the cost because they work for us. We haven't paid the bill. We, f from an accounting reporting perspective, we are required to record our accrue for the cost. Don't have to pay it. I mean, I don't have to pay Rito today for his retirement tomorrow. <laughs> this but, is the but Gatsby he, change. It right? is. That is correct. It, this it is the Gatsby change. But eventually it will be paid. Eventually it will be paid, but it and won't it, be paid. And it's for services already incurred. Yeah. It, it, is, it is no different than your Fortune 500 company. It is no different than any other state agency. That's how a pension works. Yes, sir. But on most of those, they're already funded. They don't have a huge unfunded pension liability. Uh, it all depends on how, um, I mean, it all depends on your definition of funded, right? Funded is one thing to say, I'm going to fund my mortgage 100% today. The other, say, the other thing is to say, I'm just going to fund it for what I uh, owe in the next 12 months. And I think most Fortune 500 companies and other state agencies, uh, given the, the driven by the core mission, in our case, is to educate our students, uh, uh, the actuals will come back and say, in order to sustain the fund, this is the amount of money that needs to come into the fund. Again, depending on the number of new employees, the depending on the performance of the investments, it's very complicated. So to say funded, what's funded, it all depends on what your definition is. 100%, that's not realistic. Okay, we'll talk more about that during the budgeting process. But uh, I think the conclusion is, since it's a liability, we are eventually going to pay it. It is liability that uh, it is my understanding that it's going to be a shared cost between the college institution and the state because there is a contribution component that the state provides. And so it, I would advocate of not going beyond what the state has already asking us to do. It, it would not be a prudent decision financially. Otherwise, we will not be able to focus our resources on our core mission, and that is to educate our students. Okay, one other issue. Um, deferred maintenance. That doesn't appear on the balance sheet. Uh, deferred maintenance is not a liability. It shouldn't be uh, on the balance sheet. It is an operating cost that is annualized based on what you spend for the year. But don't we report a deferral to some agency, the total amount of deferred maintenance? We report that every five years? I, I am not aware. If anything, there's probably a report that says these are the needs of the institution. But from a gap reporting perspective, you do uh, not agree with that. It would not be a gap. No, it's not a gap. Okay. Do you, accreditation. Uh, I, I think uh, so. Our accreditation on the tenure, on the tenure report, we'll okay. have a we'll have a facilities maintenance um, uh, report to them on our SACS report. Yes. That's where it's at on the SACS. I've not been able to find that number. What What was the last deferred maintenance number? Do you know? I don't know off the top of my head. I'd have to do. I'd have to <clears throat> investigate that and and look into that. But I'll be glad to. I, I've been trying to get that number, and I've been unsuccessful. So we've submitted some information to you. I don't know that we gave you a, a number 
on that. So I, I have to reach out to Mr. Alfonso, who's got who's got that, and to work with Mr. Mr. Flint to um, um, to get that number for you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but but I would say uh, in in our financial statements, if you look at our uh, our, re our income and expense, you will see a line item called repairs and maintenance. Essentially, that's to fund the deferred maintenance cost. So there is a funding mechanism in there on an annual basis that is uh, financially prudent in order to um, maintain uh, the, uh, the areas, but at the same token, not at the detriment of the funding for our educational programs and student services. It, it's reasonable. Now, we can have a conversation if that should change, definitely. Uh, but I think uh, it's reasonable at, at this stage of the game. Uh, I would also add that uh, please take a closer look at the strategic initiatives that were talked about this morning because that's setting the tone of our priorities. And if, and if deferred maintenance is a priority, then I'd say let's revisit that strategic plan and see what makes sense. I, I, do, have the, um, I do have those numbers be, uh, being worked on as we speak. And okay. So, so I'll be I'll be glad to meet with you. Okay. Maybe contribute. Put that in on the list of the next time we meet. Okay. Okay. And Duly so noted. The other piece of your long-term facilities plan in the strategic plan institutional initiatives would that in, would that include uh, maintenance needs on our facilities? Depending on how we spec out that um, that particular plan, it can. Okay. That could be a place where that answer is more fully developed out, over yeah. the, the next period of time whenever that facilities plan is going to come back into play. Understood. Okay. <coughs> Where is that company from? The, the G whatever it was. I think it's ABM now. Huh? Yeah, they, they changed. They got bought out. Um, they were from the Midwest. I don't know where ABM's from. They were, based, uh, they were based somewhere here else here in Texas. I'd have to see where they are now. Get him those answers, and and then any of those big contracts like that, we we do an annual uh, or quarterly, annual two times a year, twice a year we do a review of all the major contracts that come before the board for approval, and what their expiration date, whether or not they can be automatically renewed by staff, or if they have to come back to the board, etc. So all of our procurements go through go through that that review. Mm -hmm. Okay. So given those questions, is there um, a motion to accept the financials for April 20, 2019? Moved. Moved by Dr. Sherwood. Is there a second? second? Second by Mr. Bennett. Any additional discussion? Any public comment on item number three? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. Motion passes. Um, this next item, uh, we're going to have a report from our internal auditors. Um, Ms. McDonald will introduce it. We want to give everyone a heads up that at the conclusion of the public report, the board will be going into closed session uh, to hear a portion of that report in closed session. And so uh, just FYI, we'll clear the room at that point in time and, and then we'll come back into open session and take any action necessary and continue with the rest of our agenda. Thank you. Today we have uh, Dan Graves with Weaver, our internal audit group here and he will be providing uh, the board of report for internal audit reports for student services this is the initial report so this is the first report you will get for this particular audit on student services he will also provide you with a follow-up report for purchasing he will give you a status report of our uh, fy19 annual plan and then as the chair stated there will also be in closed session a report for it general controls so i'll go ahead and, and let dan begin thank you Good afternoon. Uh, glad to be back to present this. As Tammy said, yes, we wanted to present the overall status of our internal audit report, which includes uh, several different, uh, let me see, make sure I can operate this here. <laughs> several different uh, various reports. One is our initial internal audit over student services. Uh, the other two are follow-up reports on prior internal audits that we've performed and then over our overall internal audit plan status. And so you'll see uh, the first slide there is the status report of uh, our internal audit plan for the year. And so we had three internal audits. Uh, we presented grant management last time in February to you uh, and student services this, this time. Uh, information security was deferred. 
as well as we've completed all of the internal audit follow-ups. And so we presented human resources, admissions, financial aid uh, last time, and this time we will talk about the uh, AP purchasing and IT general controls. Uh, the only remaining item that we have that we'll all cover later in, in my presentation is the annual report. And that annual report is a, a required report that's due every year that basically gives a summary of internal audit activity and the plan for next year. Our first internal audit, our first full internal audit this, uh, for this presentation is student services. And so student services, we started in March and it went through April. We issued the final report uh, May 30th with an overall strong rating. And I believe, uh, if my memory serves me correctly, that this is the first strong internal audit rated report that we've issued here at Del Mar. So uh, uh, my commendations to the student services group, uh, Dr. Silva and his team. Uh, this was a, a fun audit for us to do. We like to do this one because it is in that core of your, your initiatives, right? This fits right in well with all the other points that we've talked about earlier today. Uh, everyone has talked about, about success points, the 60 by 30 plan. I mean, this is the core of what the college does is offering students to services, or services to students as well as, uh, as part of the educational process. So this scope uh, focused on student engagement within the student engagement and retention department covered the the risks and regulatory and compliance coverage uh, in those areas and so you'll see uh, those areas that we covered branch from student advising tutoring all the way through counseling and retention and then some compliance with ada so students with disabilities title nine and then student disciplinary actions uh, one point of uh, that you should note is that we did not overlap with the audit of admissions and registrar. And so this particularly falls into the area of student advising. We did that audit back in 2015. We've performed follow-ups on that audit uh, over the last several years. And so we didn't feel it was appropriate to overlap that. We didn't want to um, you know, be duplicative in the areas that we looked at. And so we did scope that out. Um, those areas generally in advising really cover um, continuing education of your advisors. Uh, ongoing balance training for the for those advisors and then um, the advising for incoming students so this was more of a student advising on not first first time in college students and so that's the, the big difference that I just want you to be aware of is when we talk about the scope the summary results for you um, like I said uh, a strong assessment overall we had three objectives um, two of those were strong our design of internal controls and the effectiveness of effectiveness of internal controls were both rated as strong uh, we did have six findings however the ratings on those findings do justify a strong rating and then appropriateness of system access is our third objective and that was a satisfactory rating and you'll you'll, you'll see how those risk ratings of the findings reflect back to those um, we have all the definitions of these in our, our appendix to our reports that you have um, but i'm happy to ask or answer any questions that you might have about why the ratings were what they are uh, in our objective A, we had 57 controls that we identified across all of those processes that I described. Uh, we do have some recommendations. There's five in this area, I believe. And that is really about standardizing some procedures and uh, increasing documentation. So standardized procedures for tracking the interactions with students when we advise them, uh, implement assessing tutor needs uh, on a bigger scale than what, what's currently happening. Uh, have a counseling ratio that's a little bit more favorable in students and that aligns closer with uh, some of the national standards. Implement a monthly review of students who've uh, been released to register who were previously uh, suspended or on, a, or on academic probation. And then revise a policy for student accommodation notification letters. And you'll see there that's really a timing issue um, to, to give ourselves some more time those 57 controls you'll see in our table uh, where those controls uh, quote unquote live and where those findings reside and how those affect the different pieces of the process. Um, a very strong control environment for student services. We've looked at this in other areas um, and you know, really happy to say that this was a strong rated report. Uh, I think that, that says a lot. In those areas um, for objective B, Again, strong, you'll see those, the effectiveness of internal controls is, is objective B. And wherever we had a design deficiency, we had a couple areas where we had some 
issues pop up and so you'll see that talks so that's part of the student documentation and tracking that's also the probation and suspension holds and then the time frame for uh, returning accommodation letters for for the students with disabilities and then our objective C uh, is our student access or sorry our access to some of those records in our systems and you'll see uh, our it was a satisfactory rating we did have a couple minor issues in that area that affected uh, two of our applications those findings uh, in order uh, advising session documentation again there wasn't a standardized process for the advisors to document their interactions with students so it wasn't that those interactions weren't occurring is really how it's documented to demonstrate that those did occur and when we talk about student success we talk about some of those 60 by 30 making sure that we have guided pathways all those different things as it rolls into it those continuing advising sessions are important and this is in particularly segregated to students with less than 24 credit hours because that's the mandatory requirement that this college has is that we meet with those students with less than 24 credit hours and so it really is that that smaller bucket of students that this really affects uh, assessment of tutoring needs is finding two a low risk rated finding uh, there's really about looking at our overall process of how we determine the number of tutors that we need and for which subjects and having a more formalized process by which we do that um, we didn't identify a deficiency in the number of tutors as in we had students who were on a long waiting list to receive tutors but this is more about the forward-looking planning and being able to provide a proactive service for the students counseling staff and student ratio uh, there's an international association of counseling services that provides a recommended ratio of licensed professional counselors to student body and we don't quite meet that and that was our, our basis of our evaluation was that standard and so uh, as part of that uh, we did have this low rated finding finding four and five uh, review of retention documentation again having a, a process by which we review to make sure that the students who were on academic probation have achieved all the things that they need to do to then be released to go register having a secondary review for that making sure that we've done our, our due process the, the process that the college has said that we will do so it's our own internal standard there's no external requirement for this this is an internal standard and then uh, disability accommodation letters is the same uh, we have a, a current 24-hour turnaround when our disability services issues a letter to instructors to say these are the accommodations that the student need uh, for this course and so just a, a brief education for you if you don't know is that um, any student can come and ask for an accommodation and after an evaluation by qualified professionals can then give that accommodation to a student and a specific accommodation is designed for every course and that letter is then issued to the instructor and the instructor in Del Mar's case is supposed to sign the letter and return it within 24 hours that's a very tight turn when you're talking about onboarding students the number of students we onboard the number of variety of courses course durations terms etc I know you're very well aware of that and so um, as part of our recommendation for this is actually to lengthen that timeline a little bit um, we, we have letters we have them return it's just we didn't meet our own internal 24-hour criteria so that's why this is low risk rated and then finding six we did have again in colleague and AccuTrack we had uh, three individuals or three user IDs that had access that didn't align with the job responsibilities and so that's finding six management did provide responses to all of these um, our recommendations uh, we've provided to you for the two moderate and the, the four low uh, really about standardizing processes and procedures and for um, those you know lengthening some some times for the student or for instructors to be able to reply and then removing that inappropriate access but I'm gonna let um, dr. Silva come up and tell you what management intends to do to address these findings well thank you Dan uh, first of all I want to thank Dean Sanders and her team and congratulate her on her uh, the strong uh, on the rating was strong on, on this audit they, they did a great job with this uh, going by each one of the findings first of all finding number one advising uh, that's actually in our uh, enrollment division and our director of admissions already began as uh, suggested by Weaver developing checklists and training modules and uh, the training will begin to have that out to the faculty and so that's already been done and training is will be coming soon 
uh, beginning as early as uh, a summer academy in, in a few weeks. In finding number two, the assessment of tutoring needs, uh, the uh, tutor coordinator uh, will be, uh, has already some written procedures on how to formally assess the needs for peer tutoring, both by doing it uh, prior, by looking at historical data, and also be conducting surveys as recommended by Weaver during their, their tutoring sessions as well. For finding number three, the counseling staff and student ratio, the division has submitted a request for a, another full-time counselor and a part-time counselor. We'll also be working with the counseling div uh, departments at both A&M Corpus Christi and A&M Kingsville for practicums in that case. We've done that in the past uh, as well, but we'll continue uh, building on that internship to help us with the counselor-student uh, uh, ratio on that. On uh, finding number four, on the, um, that is the, the audit of probation students. Um, the Director of Counseling and, uh, and Retention Services is going to audit the students hold for compliance and that will be at the beginning of each uh, semester to uh, make sure that students who uh, have done what they need to do to move forward uh, that their holds are released. And so that will be an internal audit conducted by our, our Director over that division as well. On Finding 5, like, uh, like Dan said, that actually was a self-imposed one day, we, we know that was a very tight turnaround. At the beginning of the semester, it's really tight to ask students and faculty to submit that. So that, that's actually something that when we, we saw that, we, we knew that that was going to be uh, a finding. Again, it was self-imposed. So that we're going to remove that, and the staff's going to work directly with faculty to uh, make sure we have an efficient communication stream, and that is done uh, quickly. Like Dan said, it hasn't been a problem. It was just something we did self-impose, and of course, that's something we just could not keep at, at that uh, length at 24 hours. And then finding number six is uh, also the, the each uh, unit under Division of uh, Student Enrollment and Engagement. They already have a plan to collaborate with IT to have periodic reviews of both access and AccuTrack to make sure that uh, there's proper access to it and people who don't need to have access um, do not have that. So. Uh, that is management's response. Again, I, I'm really proud of the division for the work that they have done, and we have uh, agreed with the, uh, the findings of Weaver and have already taken actions to uh, remediate these findings. Dr. Yes, ma'am. Can you very quickly tell me what the plan of completion, uh, a number one, what is that and what does it include? The plan of completion for advisors. Okay, that is actually a uh, internal. That uh, what Weaver has asked is that we create a standardized record keeping of documentations of advising sessions that go on. So when an advisor meets a student, that is documented uh, somehow, so it is kept for future use. Uh, when we develop a, our new, when we get our new ERP, uh, that's something else we're going to be able to be standardized as far as it is now be technically done. But what we've asked us to do is go ahead and have some kind of documentation. So we're going to have a checklist on the students, and we'll be able to say, okay, we went over these documentations with a student and have that documented in, in colleague right now. So if another advisor sees them next time, they could pick up where we left off. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll tell you, the, the current system doesn't have a great uh, avenue to which to include documentation sure. in the student records. It's just the, some system limitations to that. There's some ways around that that we discussed as part of the implementation, but right now it, it's, uh, there are some system constraints mm -hmm. and, and able to do that efficiently and effectively. Mm -hmm. And this should help the plan of completion. True, for the short term, we're going to be doing it this time. Uh, long term, once we implement the new ERP, I think we're going to have a much more effective and efficient way of doing that. Sounds good. I'm going to make an assumption here, and but I'll just make it out loud so you can tell me if my assumption is correct or not, that when we got advising in our strategic plan, Advising is going to be our QEP and the SAC COC accreditation. We've got um, issues related to advising in this internal uh, audit. I'm assuming all of these changes are going to align with each other at a point in time. Absolutely, okay. and that's why it's, uh, it is, is now our QEP and SACs. Okay. And uh, so it, it is, uh, everybody owns a little part of it, but we have a big umbrella reviewing over uh, all, all this. So absolutely, yes, your assumption is correct. Richard. And I realize that you were auditing based on previous policies, not on anything that we might be considering doing, so I. Yeah, n nothing forward looking. Okay. Any other questions on this part? Thank you. Well, that takes us to uh, 
our follow-up procedures and so as part of any other or any internal audit plan it's always healthy to go back and look and revisit prior internal audit findings and actually follow up on remediation efforts and so that is what we uh, the second stage of our internal audit plan uh, for this the purchasing follow-up um, we executed those procedures in March uh, we had our exit meeting in April and issued the final report in May that included uh, management's response and so you'll see um, it included those from the 2017 internal audit report over purchasing uh, for validation of appropriate action. We looked at the corrective action of nine findings from the 13 overall. So you'll see um, total findings from the initial report in 2017 had 13 findings. Four were previously remediated from prior follow-ups. This follow-up um, validated that we have five of those remaining nine remediated, two of those are partially remediated and two remain open. Of those, those two partially remediated findings deal with reporting of vendor transactions from cooperative purchasing agreements. And so with the cooperative purchasing agreements, we have some responsibility to report back to those co-op groups purchases made. Uh, sometimes there, there's a percentage, a sort of administrative fee that has to be paid back to the co-op. Um, sometimes that's the college pays it, sometimes the um, vendor pays that. It just depends on how the contract works out. Um, but reporting back on those, we do have some requirements. Not all the co-ops require the college to report back, but some do. And having a systematic way to do that was something that the college is working on. I will tell you that in this finding, when we went and tested, we selected a sample of 50 purchases made from those co-ops, and we found one that was still um, wasn't reported in a timely manner and timely we considered 30 days this one was reported in 43 days so one of 50 in the sample shows a lot of progress from where we were uh, th there's still some time for the process to mature that needs to occur um, because it is a sample uh, we did leave it on the list as an open or partially remediated finding uh, but that is the the progress made to date there so a lot more than what has been um, still just a little bit of maturity that remains. And then uh, monitoring of the vendor list is a annual process that is made for the sort of the, just the health and cleaning of your vendor, making sure you don't have any stale vendors on the list, duplicate vendors, it's a, it's a vendor maintenance uh, activity. Uh, again, significant improvement. We've been working with the purchasing <coughs> department on processes and procedures on how to do this. Um, there was a, a large group of vendors that got cleaned up we looked at it again and we found a few still that remained and so we've reported those back and um, we've, we've sort of worked with the purchasing department to identify and further go you know take that next step to get them all cleared up on an annual basis the two open findings are really about a formal delegation of authority that extends to thresholds for contracts uh, that I understand is a policy change that is, is uh, being worked on. And then contract renewals uh, is something to making sure that we have monitoring processes. I know we, we just talked about um, and Tammy shared that, that the board looks at those twice a year, but having a more proactive approach to that uh, is something that I know is in the works. So our recommendations are to just ensure the timely reporting of those cooperative agreements uh, implement a formal delegation of authority that, that is a policy, um, monitor contract expirations, and then uh, have a, a better process, you know, continue to, to mature the process to clean up vendor files. And so I believe management has responded to those, and uh, I think Raul is going to come up and address the, the follow-up items, the management's action plan for those. Dan, thank you for the, uh, the work you performed here. I really appreciate it. It allows us to continue to, to build our internal control system. Uh, we did, uh, first time around, implement some internal controls, and so this feedback really helps. And what we've learned is that, uh, you know, we, we've leveraged system controls, but now we are introducing a more of a manual process, a what I call a quality review, where a second set of eyes is reviewing to make sure that things are being performed uh, to, to make sure that we minimize, reduce, or eliminate these type of errors. Um, 
with respect to delegation of authority, you know, we, we, we do have a framework. It's still being vetted by senior leadership, and hopefully we can have something in place uh, so that uh, we, can, we can work with. Um, so, so those I would say those are the two major ones that that are, that are important. Uh, but Dan, if you can help me out here a little bit, uh, you know, this is a very high risk area when it comes to financial management of financial resources. Uh, in in your instances of your review, have you identified any fraud or any loss of revenues related to to fraud in this particular uh, audit, or if, as a matter of fact, any of the audits that have been performed since? 2017. No, we've not in, found any uh, areas of fraud. Uh, by, even back when we did this initial purchasing audit in 2017, we did a much more in-depth look. The, the scope of these procedures were only limited to following up on open items. So our, our review and the scope of the review was, was much more limited in this. But even back to the 2017 audit, we did not find any instances of dual purchases or split purchases or anything that would indicate potential fraud. So thank you. With that said, you know, I just want to emphasize the point that we are very sensitive to, to having sound internal controls and, and we're going to continue to, to plug away and make, try to make this a little bit better. Any questions on, on this audit? Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Who, whose responsibility is to monitor the vendor list? Oh, or? I'm sorry, what was that question? Whose responsibility is it to monitor the vendor list? So, uh, in terms of responsibilities, I, I do have uh, a, a, a person of leadership in the purchasing area. That would be Mr. David Davila. And uh, we have gone over the roles and responsibilities and gone over the segregation of duties. And so he provides the oversight, but he has delegated that task to one of his team members. Yeah. So, now I believe we found several hundred in the first bit that that were old or what we would consider stale, not having a purchase in the last year. Uh, this, I believe, was 15, if I remember the number accurate in the report, that we had identified 15 in the entire vendor list that's over 2,000 people. Yeah, over, it's, over it's, 2, it's vendors significant. Generally. And so, so yeah. It is, is much, <coughs> much better than it was. There's still was a little bit to go. Okay. Still a little bit more to go. Our second follow-up were the IT general controls. Uh, again, we performed these. We were actually in the field performing these last time I presented to you, and that was in February, so we finished that work. Uh, we dated that report uh, in April. Uh, that report, report is separately. Uh, will be presented in executive session just because of the government code uh, exemptions for public meetings because of the sensitivity of the security issues. Um, that scope did, though, um, cover the, the open findings, again, just the same as the others, the open findings that, that remain from the prior 2016 internal audit over the IT general controls. The remaining internal audit activities we have this year is the annual report. And so that report is um, due to state oversight agencies uh, by November 1st. So recognizing that the fiscal year is August 31st, uh, gives us a couple months to put that together. There's several things that go in that, the overview of the 2019 internal audit activity. So uh, very similar to the, the information you just received about the status and the results of the audits go there. Um, any description of any consulting or non-audit services performed for the college, uh, of which Weaver has not performed any to date. Um, our quality report over internal audit, so the quality report over Weaver is included in that, uh, as well as the description of the processes to approve the 2020 internal audit plan, uh, which will be presented to you uh, at a later meeting. And then a description of who's the external auditor for the college, uh, which will go along with your, your annual internal, or your annual financial statement audit. So those are the elements required to be in the report. Uh, we prepare that it's usually uh, a pretty brief five page report uh, generally with uh, it's very prescriptive by the state auditor's office and we fill that out and bring it to you for um, final approval before it gets sent out by November 1st. So that is the remaining uh, activity that we have for this year. Any questions on it? Okay. okay. So with that, then uh, the board will now go into closed session 
under Texas Government Code 551.089 to deliberate regarding security devices or security audits regarding security assessments, deployments, or audits related information, resource technology, certain network security information, the deployment or specific occasions for implementation of security personnel, critical infrastructure, or security devices, or information confidential under Texas Government Code 552.139, including the internal audit report for the information technology general controls of Weaver and Tidwell LLP with possible discussion and action in open session. It is 2.49 p.m. We'll take just a few minutes to clear the room, please. We think this will take 20 minutes, 15. It will take, I, my presentation is brief. Okay. Um, questions is another questions story. Questions is a different, <laughs> yes, control. so that, that is purely dependent on, on the board. Thank you. board has returned from closed session at 3 10 p.m. Uh, I will entertain a motion to accept the internal audit report uh, from Weaver and Associates as discussed in both uh, open and closed session. Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion that we accept the internal audit report as presented in open and closed session. Thank you very much. Second by uh, Mr. Rivas. Any discussion? Is there any public comment on that motion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. Motion carries. Thank you again, Mr. Graves, for being Thank with you us. Very we much. appreciate it. Uh, we will now move on to item number five, which is a discussion and past possible action related to a tax abatement extension. And Dr. Escamilla and Ms. Uh, Keyes will introduce that, and then we'll hear from our guest. We have Mike Culberson with us from the Corpus Christi Regional Economic Development Corporation to talk to us about an, uh, an amendment to an existing abatement with uh, Epic Pipeline Company. Is it? Yes, Epic Y Grade. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, Regents. Mike Culberson. Uh, the uh, this is a, a fractionator which brings um, any, uh, um, natural gas liquids down, and it's just right across from, uh, on Violet Road, right across from uh, Lion Del Bacel. Uh, the board passed a, uh, the tax abatement in December 2017, as did uh, Nueces County, and Cal Allen uh, passed a uh, Chapter 313 tax limitation for them. Um, part of the agreement, however, had them needing to close by 1 January 2019. They did that on the initial, on the large part of the uh, project, but there was another part that they wanted to include in that, and they did not close that because of different owners until f February 12th. The item before you asked that you amend the, the tax abatement in Section 4 to extend that from January 1st to February 12th. The Nueces County passed the same amendment on May 8th, and I stand uh, ready to answer any questions. Uh, staff obviously recommends approval. How long of an extension are they asking for? Sir? How long of an extension are they asking for? Uh, 42 days. Okay. Yes, sir. Any questions from the board? Hmm? Is there a motion to, to approve the extension? I'll second it. Mr. Rebus made the motion. Dr. Adami seconded that motion. Is there any public comment related to this item? Seeing none, all those in favor of the extension say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Thank Culberson. Thank you. See you in August. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Mr. Garcia is going to discuss uh, uh, possible action related to designation of a financial auditor for our annual financial audit services. Yes. Uh, on, an, on a regular basis, the college is asked to demonstrate sound financial reporting and sound internal controls to mitigate errors or omissions in our finances. An annual audit of our financial information is a tool used to measure sound financial management. This action item is to engage Collier, Johnson, and Woods to perform an annual audit of the college's finances. The college has a history of working with this firm, and it's evident that the firm is grounded on the technical complexities of institutions of higher education. So, uh, 
So I asked the board to take action on the recommendation to hire Collier, Woods, and Johnsons for the annual services. For the next uh, five years, it's going to be an annual contract renewal to be negotiated each year. Um, I'll move to, to accept them. I just have a question. Was there any reason why other people didn't apply? No, no, we, we had a number of people. Uh, uh, well, okay, good, good point. Let me ref backtrack a little bit. We reached out to 11 different institutions. Um, we uh, sent out the RFP, and we also made some phone calls. Uh, in addition to that, um, we did have a questionnaire by a firm who expressed interest, and we, um, we, we did uh, respond to it. But uh, for whatever reason, we only ended up with one particular firm. Uh, and that was Johnson and Woods. Okay, I move to approve them. I yes. Them. I second. Okay. <laughs> All right, motion by Mr. Rivas, second by Ms. Estrada. We'll let her have the, the credit this time. Yes, thank you. Any other discussion or questions related to this item? All those in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say no. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Was there any public comment related to this item? Thank you. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say no. Motion passes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. Um, Mr. Alfonso is out today, but our next item is related to allocation of 2014 bond contingency funds. Now Mr. Garcia is going to help Mr. us. Mr. Garcia this. is going to do that one as well, or introduce it. Just this is related to the contingency funds for the Workforce Development Building. Is this for the Ford uh, audio? Ford audiovisual. Audio visual, yes. Yeah, that's the ticket. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You're filling in. Yes. I'll, I'll help you. All right. Bear with me a few minutes. <laughs> Wait, this one, is this number eight or number nine? It's number seven. Number seven, seven. sorry. The Gamby Audio Visual Systems. Correct. Okay, good. We're on the pa same page here. Yes, uh, today's students uh, are tech savvy and bring high expectations for instruction into the classroom. Every audio, audio video systems adds value to the learning experience. The 2014 bond provided for Datacom Design Group to work with <coughs> academic facilities, chairs, and deans, <coughs> excuse me, to scope and design the classroom, AV requirements across disciplines. Each academic department was able to specify their teaching technology desires, desires to be placed in the building plans. This action item is geared to seek board authorization to authorize administration to award the contract via a consortium to Ford AV. Ford AV will perform a turnkey acquisition installation training warranties of all classroom technology requirements as designed for each academic discipline within the Gamby building project. Uh, and I will add that you know we have prior experience in working with this vendor in in some of the workforce yeah, uh, the West programs. campus West campus yeah this is a firm that's but we've already worked with um, has expanded um, uh, their scale and scope over to the uh, general academic building and um, this is the end user uh, piece portion of the technology uh, plan for the building this is the the actual flat screens and and, tech and and projectors and all the things that will transmit and receive uh, the information for our, for our classrooms. Any questions related to this? It's in the budget. Board? It's all part of the plan. So it doesn't require board approval. <laughs> it does. <laughs> That's where we're asking for your consideration to approve to move ahead. Okay, I so move. Thank you, Mrs. Strada. Second by Ms. Favorite. Uh, is there any public comment related to this item? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Now, item number eight. I'm sorry for the confusion. I checked off the wrong item. <laughs> uh, now item number eight, which is discussion possible action uh, to allocate 2014 bond contingency funds to the Workforce Development Building Construction Project. So Mr. Brett Flynn from AGCM is here, as well as Mr. Robert Duffy with Physical Facilities to talk about uh, our item for number eight. Thank you, Mr. President, Madam Chairman, Regents, good afternoon. 
If you recall, in last month's meeting, we had a, an update on the 2014 bond, and we mentioned at that point that we were tracking some changes on the workforce development project. Um, a number of those changes are moving forward or need to move forward, and in, in addition, we've identified some others. The total, we're looking at about $500,000 in additional funding necessary to complete this project. Um, as we recall, the initial owner's contingency fund of $150,000 is about 1% of construction costs. With the identified co changes, will it be at about 4% of identified construction costs, which is well within industry standard. Um, the changes are primarily due to um, a number of items, most of them typical to construction, some change site conditions, coordination issues with different utilities trying to make them all fit together in the right place, and some regulatory issues with the city that came up that required some changes to the utility, and some changes that were in regard to what was originally thought planned to be owner furnished, owner installed equipment that is now being installed by the contractor. Yes. As a result, we're asking for the permission to move $500,000 from the West Campus contingency to the workforce development project. There is currently $2.8 million in identified contingency for the West Campus. Still within the overall budget to include the contingency for that particular project? Very much so. Any questions or comments related to this item? What are CAMs? Can you? A CAM is a contingency allowance modification. This is a, it's the I tool we use to move money from the fund that is there for contingencies to the contract. Okay. It's <coughs> a new one. Is there a motion to approve, to authorize um, the allocation of these contingency funds? Dr. Sherwood makes the motion. Second by Second. Dr. Adami. Thank you very much. Are there any public comments related to this item? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, say no. That motion passes. Now we're going to have this next one. Yes, it's this next one is item number nine. It, it, it's seeking uh, consideration from the board uh, to authorize administration to allocate uh, con some con more contingency funds for improvements to the West Campus. We're talking about um, some some water pipes coming in for some additional um, uh, fire hydrants uh, for the campus um, that were were not um, were not foreseen in the early, on the onset of this project. The city has come in and, and asked us yes. to to install these particular hyd in, in fire hydrants. Yes, in conjunction with the uh, the two projects on the west campus, the emerging technology expansion and the workforce development. The city required that the college redo the plat for that property, and in so doing, the city has asked or is requiring that we install a new fire hydrant loop along the, the roadside there and install some sidewalk along Santa Elena Street as public improvements. Uh, the fire hydrants are basically, we're increasing the footprint of the campus. We need to increase the fire protection capability. Um, the sidewalk is just public access. Um, these are required by the city in order to to finalize the plat, and they may require these com these improvements to be completed before they issue a certificate a certificate of occupancy for the buildings. Um, based on preliminary estimates, we're guess we're we're estimating one hundred eighty five thousand three hundred and seventy three dollars for both of those items, and request that the board provide approval to allocate contingency funds to complete that work. Great. Any questions on this item? Is there a motion to authorize? Move. Second. Take a motion by Ms. Averett, second by Mr. Rivas. Uh, are, is there any public comment related to this item? If not, all those in favor of the action to authorize administration to allocate uh, the 2014 contingency funds for improvements, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, say no. That motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. This time we will take general public comment uh, from any members of the public who would like to comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Jack Gordy. 
Mr. Gordy. Okay, we'll let him come back in at the end. Miss Jackie, uh, Jackie Adamson. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Jackie Adamson. I'm an associate professor of psychology here at Del Mar College. And I am here today to present an amendment to the B543 complaint and the B550 complaint that I filed last month with you at the regular meeting. Uh, this is in light of more recent events that have occurred subsequently. And um, I think it's important. There are three points I'd like to, to point out. Number one, the uh, general counsel and the president numerous times tried to prevent the Faculty Promotion Appeals Committee to do their, do what they were um, formed to do. Uh, this committee was, is an independent committee elected by peers. Uh, democratically elected by their peers and independent of administration. Administration tried to thwart their attempts to do their duty. Uh, fortunately, they went ahead and held the hearing and the Promotion Appeals Committee uh, unanimously recommended in my favor all points I made in my appeal. Uh, and so I'm here to present those, to, to, to point those out to you as well. Um, of course, I was promoted, but there were other issues in the appeal. For instance, the negative comments that need to be removed from my record, which were unsubstantiated, and according to policy A6.6.6.2, um, those uh, statements, general statements, cannot be allowed. They have to be supported by specific evidence, and no specific evidence was ever provided. And so that is my third reason for being here. My third, and for this uh, appeal, this uh, amendment, is because you have to remove negative comments that are not supported by specific evidence according to the policy I just cited. And administration continues to try to thwart my attempts to do that, to have them do that. I have asked num numerous times, I've filed numerous grievances and appeals, and they go into the general counsel's heap of under legal review and they never get satisfied. They never, I don't get my due process. I don't get my right to uh, speak freely, and I don't get my right to equal protection under the law. And that's all I'm asking for. I'm asking for the board to please, under step number four of B5.43, I'm asking that I be allowed to meet with the, the board in, in, in closed uh, session or in open session, either one. But if you look at step four in B543, I have the right to approach the board and ask for that. And the board is supposed to grant me an open or a closed session meeting to avail myself to them regarding this process. And that's what I did. And on June 5th, I received a letter from general counsel telling me that I could not do that. Again. And so I'm, I'm at a loss. And I'm asking you to please uh, follow policy and allow me to avail myself to you according to step four of B543 process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Adamson. Dolores Huerta. Good afternoon. I'm Dolores Huerta, faculty member in the Department of Business Administration. Uh, I'm here today to tell you about an incident which occurred in one of my classes at the end of the spring semester. When I returned an assignment, a student was unhappy about her grade. So while I was working with other students uh, and without my knowledge, she posted a vulgar, <coughs> excuse me, a vulgar and obscene message, including my name on Facebook. When I found out about it two days later, I forwarded the post to my chairperson. She forwarded it to Dean Cheryl Garner uh, relative to the student conduct policy. Ms. Schramerick also sent the postage to Agustin Rivera, legal counsel's office, to see if the Facebook post could be removed. I also emailed Mr. Rivera as well. Dean Garner's staff called the student in and handled the situation uh, as much as the current policy allows, neither my chairperson nor I ever got a response from the legal counsel's office. Let me add that the student also filed a grievance against me during final exams to which I responded in great detail. 
she chose not to appeal my rebuttal to her grievance. I ask you, the board, to consider drafting a policy regarding social media, perhaps not only for students, but for the entire college community, so that there is some degree of responsibility. I know full well I am not as naive as to know that this has not happened before and will not happen again, but I ask you as a board to consider drafting that policy. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Huerta. Mr. Jack Gordy. Mr. Gordy is not in attendance. Is there anyone else who would like to speak in public comment? Seeing none, the board will now enter into closed session under Texas Government Code 551.074, personnel matters regarding the appointment, employment, evaluation, reassignment, duties, discipline, or dismissal of a public officer or employee, including annual evaluation of the college president, and two, duties, regent duties, responsibilities, and statement of ethics with possible discussion and action in open session. And Texas Government Code 551.071, consultation with legal counsel regarding pending or contemplated litigation or legal claims or a settlement offer with possible discussion and action in open session and the seeking of legal advice from counsel with possible discussion and action in open session. The time is 3.30 p.m. We will take a short recess. The board has come back from closed session at 5.37 p.m. There is no action to be taken. Uh, we will now go to our calendaring. Um, we have before us the next four months of calendars, um, or current month and the next three months after that. We have a, another board uh, meeting and workshop on July the 9th. And then in August, you'll see the series of meetings, uh, including board day, and we will confirm as soon as possible whether or not we're going to have a workshop on the 13th. Uh, we'll note that you have not seen previously on August 19th, there will be convocation, uh, and we'll get the details on that as soon as possible, going into our uh, board meeting date in September of September 10th. Any other additions or questions or anything about calendar? If not, then the board is adjourned at 5.38 p.m.